Welcome to CivilNet. I'm joined today by Edith Alavertian, a psychotherapist and author who is currently in Armenia. She is based in Los Angeles. Uh, we'll be discussing some issues related to mental health, uh, her own past, and intergenerational trauma, and what exactly that is. So Edith, thank you very much for your time. Thank you for having me. It's an honor. Um, I want to start off by getting to know a bit more about you. Um, can you tell us about uh, your Armenian roots, um, where you're from, and also how you got into psychotherapy? Sure. Uh, well, I'm as Armenian as a person could get, <laughs> born and raised here, a natural citizen here um, in Armenia. And uh, I was born in Harazdan, yes. uh, near Tzachgador. It's a beautiful little town. Um, I went up to third grade here. I went to a school called Avetik Isahakyan and um, went to around third grade and then migrated to the United States of America with my parents in 1994, April 28th. Mm -hmm. um, continued my education in LA. Um, I went and I got my bachelor's in psychology and then received my master's in marriage and family and child therapy. Mm -hmm from the University of Phoenix, which is placed in Arizona, state of Arizona. And uh, I did a lot of my residency, which is practicum work at BHC Alhambra Hospital, which is a mental health hospital and uh, finished. And uh, yeah, and since then I've just been working as an associate psychotherapist. I work in a private practice and I'm working with women, children, men, families, and um, you know, trying to have my voice heard in our community that um, mental health needs to be accepted in our community whether we are ashamed of it or not and I think I'm doing a pretty good job. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And, and because of that, I want you to explain some things to our watchers that they may not know. For example, what is the difference between psychology and psychotherapy? Um, and being a psychotherapist and a psychologist. And a psychiatrist. Psychiatrist. So that's, that's a great question. Um, so a psychiatrist is a medical doctor. So in order to be a psychiatrist, you have to go to medical school. Mm -hmm. And what psychiatrists do is they work with more intense um, situations. So if someone is a schizophrenic, if someone has bipolar disorder, and they are in need of medication. Now, not all people need medication if they're experiencing psychological stressors. Mm. Um, so a psychiatrist is there if you need medication assistance, if it's something that is clearly unworkable and you really are in dying need of medication. A psychologist is somebody who does testing. So if a psychotherapist, like if I am to diagnose someone with let's just say ADHD, or if I'm noticing that a child has autism tendencies, um, psychologists usually run a test to confirm the diagnosis if the confirmation is needed. So other than psychotherapy, they also run testing, okay? They do psychological tests. Um, psychotherapists like myself, we're usually the talkers. We we do interventions, we diagnose as well, and we do the treatment. So we cannot prescribe medications and we cannot do psychological testings. So each have their role and they're all very important. So if I have somebody that I feel like needs psychological testing, I would refer them out to a psychologist. And if the psychologist feels like, okay, this is something that needs medication, they would refer them to the psychiatrist. So it's like a good little team there. And I'm also curious, um, uh, when you wanted to go into this, this field, did the Armenians around you in, in, in your life, were they pretty much on board? And I also want to ask, now, when you do your practice, do you have Armenians uh, come to you? And, and how do you feel about that? Uh, it's been a journey. I'll tell you that um, my Dr. Daniel Amen, he's one of the my, my favorite psychiatrists. He does a lot of brain studies. He said, till today, my my father says, why couldn't you just become a real doctor? And that actually stuck by me because it's true. Like a lot of people, when they hear about what you do, they're like, what? So you mean you just sit there and you gossip? <laughs> they don't understand the concept. Um, I ran into a lot of trouble and a lot of rejection from the community, but I'll tell you something, I am so proud of our people. 
I am just incredibly proud of our people because lately they have been speaking up more. Yes. I have been getting a lot of followers, people have been resharing my videos, um, and so they're starting to come around and understand that having a problem or a stressor, it's not anything to be ashamed of. Mm -hmm. And I am beyond happy to see that and to answer your last question absolutely i do have armenian clients and i'm just so proud of them for picking up the phone and calling because it's such a difficult thing to do for our people um, but they're doing it and they're doing a damn good job and i'm fascinated by the the parallel between the two themes of armenians and mental health issues and mental yes. health attention i i like uh, californians and I like also how I meet many Californians who seem to have no stigma around like seeking med uh, mental health yes. attention and that in the past, you know, you had self-help, all these like things. Um, yes. But in Ar Armenia, a lot of people are speaking recently about this like this change that a lot of people now, this sort of stigma around mental health perhaps is lifting. I'm wondering if you've noticed that and have you seen that manifest in any way? I am. I'm definitely seeing a notice and it is manifesting because people are starting to speak up more about their experiences. Um, and I'll tell you why. And I'm not taking credit, uh, but I'm giving credit to the whole community. I'm speaking up about the importance of expression. You're speaking up the importance of expression. Um, people are resharing. People are being more expressive in general and it is manifesting in that way because they're like, oh, so if let's just say this person is experiencing depression symptoms, not depression, the symptoms of depression after the war, that's something that I'm experiencing. So I'm not alone in this. Mm -hmm. And it feels so good not to be alone in this. And then that person starts talking. So it's, it does, it manifests. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the most hardest things of our community was to just open our mouth and just start expressing. That expression piece was the hardest stigma to, to overcome because as soon as we start talking about our experience, what happens? A person shuts us down or we get made fun of, right? Ridicule or it's, oh, that's, you know, your problem is nothing. Just listen to what I'm going through. It's undermining the other person's problem. So I think the more we express, the more it manifests. So yes, I'm definitely seeing a change. And um, when it comes to Armenians, we hear the, the, the phrase intergenerational trauma sometimes. And I'm wondering if you can explain to our watchers what is intergenerational trauma? Yes. So intergenerational trauma is the easiest way to explain. I try to stay away from the psychological terms and the big words because sometimes some people have a really hard time reaching that. So the best way to explain it is something that exactly you and I are going through, exactly you and your parents went through. So it's that anger, it's that resentment, it's that pain of what happened to us in 1915. And the, it's the teraspanotion, that word. So that has impacted. And, and some professionals might say, you know, not a lot of people can go through intergenerational, intergenerational trauma because their families were not impacted by the genocide. They didn't have family in the genocide. I say the complete opposite because for me as a professional, you don't have to experience trauma to go through trauma. Seeing it and hearing it is enough and it's big T, little t. Whether you have experienced it or not, just seeing it and having the whole community talk about it, march about it, all every year we march, whether it's here or in LA or in, in you know Europe, we're constantly talking about it. That's enough for someone to, to feel that pain that our people in 1915 went through this. So to me, that already is an intergenerational trauma and um, I don't want to say I don't have it because I didn't have parents in a genocide. My people were in the genocide and that's enough for me to experience that. And do you think that explains in part why certain groups, um, be it uh, religious or ethnic, um, it can affect their relationship almost with other groups that haven't experienced intergenerational trauma, when it, perhaps when it comes to communication or speaking about certain certain topics. I think that sometimes um, people from certain groups that haven't had those experiences 
get sometimes a bit frustrated when communicating with people with intergenerational trauma because of that dynamic. I'm wondering if you can tell anything, say anything about that. Well, this is an in interesting topic because I'm, I'm definitely going to answer your question. But before I answer your question, I wanted to actually cover something on that. When the war was happening um, in LA, um, we were just appalled and just so hurt that the message was not being spread. Mm -hmm. So, um, but when I was talking to my friends that were non-Armenians, they kept saying, well, the reason why we're not talking about it is because we don't know what's going on. And I think the cure to that is to explain what's going on. It's to have your voice heard. But I think because we have so much underlying pain and mind you, anger is the first layer, right? When someone comes in with anger, it's not anger issues. There's something underneath the anger. There's a lot of layers of this childhood. It's trauma. It's, it's you know, all these things. So we relay, um, you know, information about the genocide with what? With so much like pain and frustration. So people see the pain and frustration, they get confused. They're like, yes. what is going on? Why are all these people shouting? Why are all these people marching? Yes, I think a lot of the people, Armenian journalists, um, they did such an amazing job talking about it and relaying the message to the community of what's going on. But then that's when people started understanding what's happening is that voice of, oh, okay. So our march, our anger, our pain can definitely trigger other cultures that haven't experienced it because what they see is that, <laughs> right? It's that pain. but. Um, and I don't even blame us for that. And I mean us because I love to con connect with everyone. Um, we're, we're, we still need work on being more transparent. Okay. The day we become more transparent calmly is when we will have people listen to us. Because how do you get people to listen to you? So you, do you think that um, Armenians should take into account the fact that they're Armenian when they're trying to figure out their own mental health and trying to put that into the equation of figuring out uh, how they're feeling, why they're reacting to things the way they're reacting to. Absolutely. Own it. <laughs> I mean, there's no going around. And I think when you're trying to go around and deny it and, uh, you know, it makes it kind of worse. So I'm big on authenticity. I think if you're experiencing something, own it and, and say it's because of this. Look, I'm, I'm not trying to say because of our behaviors, um, we're not trying to excuse anything here. I want to make sure I cover that because some people say, well, it's not an excuse to beha behave angry. It's not an excuse to beha behave disrespectfully. And we're not excusing it, but it's very important to acknowledge it, that this is where it's stemming from. And, you know, Somebody wrote me the other day, and I love that comment, that it's not just 1915. Of course it's not just 1915. A lot of the things come from childhood. But it's an impact of how we have raised our children. Trauma impacts how we see the world. Trauma impacts how we process things. Um, if you have an individual who's had years of trauma and gets married, which they have their right to, and has children, um, without the proper understanding of what they're experiencing, they're going to transfer that pain onto their kids. And this is what we see in parenting most of the days. So absolutely acknowledging these things are important, whether you're Armenian or whether you're African American or, you know, from Israel, it doesn't matter if you have a certain trauma and experience, you own it, you research it, you study about it and you get the proper help that you need. And after the end of the 2020, uh, 44 day war, uh, we know that there's thousands of cases now of Armenian servicemen who are suffering from PTSD um, yes. and, and, other, uh, and other conditions. I mean, now there's this big drive to create the facilities in Armenia to deal with this huge number of people. And obviously there are people that weren't servicemen that also um, have, uh, who need attention um, that isn't to do with the war. But I want to ask, um, when, we're looking at this uh, aspect, which is to do with the war, to do with conflict. Is there a, a different type 
of attention that's needed compared to, I don't know, other, other practices? Should, is that something that needs to be considered? Well, it depends from which side we're talking about, from the clinical aspect or from the people's? I, I'm, I'm thinking clinical, like is, is a different type of attention needed to people who were, for example, uh, veterans? I mean, clinically, I don't know, you know, I try to visit uh, some facilities here that have psychiatrists, psychologists, and I, and I wasn't really lucky, uh, but let's put the clinical aside. I mean, I'm a clinician, I have, you know, well seasoned from someone my age might study and study and read and read. But psychology is so narrow. Spirituality is just yeah. so big and huge and impactful. So we can look at veterans from a psychological standpoint and label PTSD, depression, this, bipolar, this, that, and, and what have you for the lack of a better word. But what is the most important thing here? You're dealing with another human being. And the most important thing to have, whether you're a clinician or not, is that empathy and that sympathy. That this person has experienced something incredibly difficult. And for a minute, you have to put that psychology aside and look at this person as a human and try to really understand their mindset and what they have just gone through. Now, do a lot of people have empathy? No, it's hard. And that's why um, a lot of people, what do they do? They shy away from therapy, psychotherapy and psychology because it's really difficult um, when someone's coming in with a problem, something severe like PTSD, um, and you're there labeling, you have this, you have that, and this is what we need to do, and this medication, if they get, you know, not, all clinicians are this way, but we're just, you know, talking about the worst case scenario. Um, I think the most important thing is to ha kind of have that sympathy and empathy of what this person has experienced first before you go full blown into your clinical status. So when you, uh, you, as you mentioned, you're a clinician, clinician, for example, you wouldn't do that. You, you wouldn't try and, in, let's say, intimidate in a way. No. Uh, no, absolutely not. When I, I used to work for LA Family Housing, and they are a um, they work with homeless population, with veterans as well, American veterans, and um, I had a lot of veterans that you know I was a social worker for. I still was in school at that time, but I honestly I learned it the difficult way when when you you know proceed with clinical work. Um, it, it's intimidating. You have your intake questions and what have you, but I think the most important thing is just to be human in the first couple of sessions, just to build rapport and have that connection that this person doesn't need to be intimidated, this person isn't alone, there's someone who understands them. And that's, that's a gift of God to me, is having that empathy for that person, like, you know, um, I'm going to hold your hand, like I'll be, I'll be your support system and we can work on this together. Like if you were diagnosed with PTSD, that impacts all of us, You're, it's not just you. Mm -hmm. So I think the most important role for a clinician is to step into the shoes of that person. Um, people are craving that. Mm -hmm. and you don't even have to have PTSD, you are craving that, I am craving that, is that understanding that, you know, hey, you know, I'm, I'm here for you kind of voice. Mm -hmm. Um, hopefully that answers and... Uh, well, I was going to add, because I should, probably should have asked this question sure. before, but w what is post-traumatic stress disorder? Can you explain to our watchers what it is? Because I think there is a lot of misnomers and a lot of misunderstanding of really about what is PTSD. Well, um, yes. So a lot of people will say, I have PTSD, and I hear that around, you know, like random conversations, I have PTSD. For a clinician like myself to diagnose an individual with, with PTSD, they have to undergo the criteria of the DSM. So we have this little book I call the Clinical Bible. Um, it's a pretty thick book and they have to meet several criteria like nightmares and flashbacks and you know, um, lack of appetite and sleep. And so it comes with a lot of uh, dilemmas. And so for somebody to be diagnosed, they have to meet the the proper criteria, and it, let me tell you, PTSD is something really intense. If um, 
anyone has PTSD, I just acknowledge and praise them for their courage and their strength because it is not something difficult to live with for sure. Um, but uh, they undergo flashbacks. So just to kind of answer your question, what it is, is that somebody with PTSD could be sitting here and at any moment they could be triggered and they can feel like they're at war. So they reenact that war scene and they, they can you know, hide under the seat. It's just pretty intense. Like flashbacks are pretty intense. Nightmares are pretty intense. So it's basically taking them back to reliving that moment that has triggered trauma in their brain. Very intense. How do you think that the um, mental health structures that are in place in Armenia should approach um, servicemen or other people with with uh, PTSD. You said you also visited uh, some places, some facilities. What did you think when you saw them? What do you think could be improved? I'm wondering as someone who has a lot of experience in this field, what recommendations you would have for, for Armenia? You know, that's such a sensitive topic for me and I feel like if I give my opinion I'm gonna sound like this mean 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 horrible individual I mean I, I have my my thoughts on that but again I'm gonna circle back to the psychology and spirituality piece you can't use spirituality in everything you can't use psychology in everything but one of the things that we're lacking is accepting that there's this problem we can't fix anything, well, we're not fixers, but we can't go about recognizing anything or working on anything if we don't recognize that there is an issue, there is a problem. And so if we have beautiful men that are coming back from war and they're hurt and there's issues, and if the families are not recognizing it, or you know what, better yet, if they're, they're ashamed to talk about it, which is incredibly understandable of why, uh, because of our cultural stigma, I don't think they, I don't think they want to struggle with that. They want to be heard and seen, but who's going to tell them that it's okay? Um, and you and I have to go and tell them that it's okay, and there, there's this issue for them to be at that that comfort piece. So it's it's the community. It's all of us. We all impact each other. So if we're kind of saying, ah, oh, it's okay, it's war, it's PTSD, that problem is never going to get acknowledged. And you're visiting Armenia. You mentioned you were last here in, in 2019. Mm -hmm. How are you finding it? How has it been for you? What do you think? And uh, do you, will you come back? Do you have plans to come <laughs> back to Armenia again? I will always come back to my home. This is my home. Um, I will always come back to Armenia. I have family here. I have friends here. I have, you know, a lot of, you know, I have a lot established here. Um, I will always return. But the difference, uh, of course, the pain keeps growing and you see it within people. And this is something that I talked about last week on an important podcast, that the pain is growing. Instead of healing, <laughs> we're going backwards. We're not healing. And that breaks my heart. Oh, Edith, thank you as always. This was very fascinating. It's my honor. Thank you for having me. And thank you for joining us on Civil Now.